Hey, hey, how many of you enjoyed that worship, getting into his presence, establishing his Holy Spirit? There's nothing like it. Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm up here to do the announcements today, and I'm just so honored, so honored to do that, to, to be here this evening. I want to tell you, I don't know about you guys, but for me, Monday and Tuesday were long. I missed you guys. It was a long time since Sunday. I feel like Sunday happened, and then I've been on a journey, and now I made it back here to the house. So I'm very happy to see you guys. Um, so I want to announce we have uh, Friday Bible study. How many of you guys are enjoying Bible study on Fridays? Good. I'm having a good time, too. Um, and then we have uh, Sunday morning, we're going to have the class. If you're part of the class, try to get here around 845. Class starts at uh, 855 exactly. So if you're going to grab some coffee or whatever you're going to do, try to get here at 845, I would say. And then um, we'll have service. We're having a casting vision yeah. service on Sunday. You don't want to miss out. Prepare yourselves. Pray before you get to church. Come in here ready. I was, I, you know, I just feel like we're um, up here. We're establishing um, holy ground, miracles. Every time we come in here, and, and you, guys, you guys know some things are happening here. Every service. And as we go, it's, it's, um, it's going to get gooder and gooder. And, um, and so I just sense that holy ground, holy ground. This is holy ground when we walk in here. So um, come ready on uh, Casting Vision Sunday. Invite somebody. Um, let's stay excited, excited for what God is doing on Sundays. So thank you. How's everyone doing tonight? I have the privilege of taking up the offerings and tithes tonight. And uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to, before we do that, if you need the offering envelope, raise your hand. We have the ushers ready to uh, give them out, hand them out. Be looking at in Acts 20, 35. In everything we do, and everything I did, I show you this by his kind of hard work. We must help the weak. Remember the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I know that you're thinking, you know what? I want to receive. I, I want to receive. But actually, it's better when we bless others. The true trueness of your heart is when you bless others. And I would encourage you tonight, as we, as we go and take up the offerings and tithes, that you would bless back the Lord, for he's given us so much. He's gave us a beautiful building. He let us rise up this morning, go to work. We're able to walk. We're able to get in our cars. We're able to go and use our skills that the Lord blessed us with. I have skills that the Lord blessed me with. I didn't go to school, but it's a gift. But I know with these gifts that the Lord has given me, that I don't think it's all mine. I want to give back to God. For he has given me so much. And I'm not just talking about this uh, a house, a car. I'm talking about my spiritually walk with God. My relationship with God. It's a beautiful thing when you have a relationship with the Lord. He's always there for us. And can we be there for him tonight? Let's just come forward. Can we be there for him tonight and give back to him? For he's given you so much. All he asks for us to do is give 10% back. And that's not even going, we should even give more. I would challenge us tonight to give 10 plus 10%. And to see what God does with what you give back to him. He's going to do so much more with it than we could ever imagine. We don't even know where the, the blessings that you pour back to God, where he stretches them, where he puts them. The people that are reached by what you're given. Praise the Lord. 
If you're ready to give, the ushers are ready to receive it. What you're ready to give back to God. Father, Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we thank you, Father, Lord. We ask, Father, Lord Jesus, that we would be a blessing to others, Father, Lord, that we wouldn't put our hearts and mind on what we're going to receive from giving back to you, Father, Lord, for we know that you are a much better steward with the money, Father, Lord, with our time, Father, Lord. And I pray right now, Father, Lord, that you would receive what we gave to you tonight, Lord, and stretch it, Father, Lord, stretch it all over the world, Father, Lord, that the lost who don't know you, Father, Lord, will hear about you through these offerings that we give back to you, Lord. And we thank you, Father, Lord, for what you're going to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise offering one more time. God bless you guys. I appreciate you guys being in the house of the Lord. We've had some technical difficulties today, but that's all right. We can still worship God. Is that all right? Amen. Praise the Lord. While we are so blessed, listen, before uh, the word goes forward tonight, there's a couple of things I want to make sure that we uh, inform you about. Number one is, I apologize, my wife's not here. Uh, she's been sick uh, last night, this morning, this afternoon, been in bed, uh, just throwing up and just feeling really sick. So pray for her. Also, Sister Stephanie, who comes here to church, um, her father, she's been taking care of her father for a number of years. Her father is with the presence of the Lord. He went on to be with the Lord today. So we want to pray for her. Amen. Keep her in prayer. Ask God to just minister to her, strengthen her and the family. Let there be encouragement and strength over them. So uh, just keep them in prayer. Anyone else, amen, that you know is maybe sick, going through stuff in their body, let's pray. Believe God for a healing over them. Amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. Uh, come on. Bless the Lord. Thank you. Um, we're, we're honored and blessed. Um, you know, tonight, uh, Jonathan's going to come and minister the word. And uh, I read his sermon. He sends me his sermons. I read it. And I tell you what, man, I'm excited tonight for the, what the Lord has deposited in his heart. I want you to open up your heart and receive the word of God. Pull on the spirit of God. Listen, pull on his spirit. Amen. As he's up here ministering. Let's give the Lord a clap offering one more time as Jonathan comes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Um, I won't be too long tonight. I'm tired. I'm sure you guys are tired too. Um, it's been a long week. Uh, if we can do me a favor, if we can just bow our heads as we pray before Jesus. Father God, I come before you and I just thank you, God, for the opportunity you've given me to speak to your people, Jesus. God, I pray that every frustration, every hurt, every battle, every sickness, every disease, everything that would try to hinder us here tonight, Father God, we rebuke it and we cast it out of this place right now, Jesus. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would just begin to flood this room right now, Lord. Lord, let your tangible presence take over me, Father, and take over each individual in this place, Father. Let your glory sit on us tonight, Father. Lord God, we ask that you would give us an ear for a new conviction tonight, God. That we would hear what it is you have to say to us, Jesus. Lord, we ask all this in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, Eddie. Amen. Tonight I have a, uh, a message um, that has been heavy on my heart for uh, a few months now. But this week, on Monday, um, I saw something that completely disgusted me, and, and I said, this is where we have to draw the line. This week, I don't know if any of you um, have been online, but uh, on Monday morning, I opened up my Instagram when I was at work, and I seen a, a video of a men's conference of about 8,000 men and in this men's conference, they have this huge stage. They've taken over a, an, an arena. And in the middle of this stage, they've built a pole. And before the service begins, the opening ceremony of this service, of this men's conference, they hired a man who was a former stripper to come out and stand in the middle of God's stage with a stripper pole behind him and he removes his shirt and he began doing this routine 
I won't call it a stripping routine because it wasn't. But he begins doing this routine where he's climbing up and down the pole and he's swallowing swords. It was just a very sexual act. And I, I was completely disgusted by it. That a men's meeting where men are coming to be empowered in the house of God, that we open up a service not with prayer, we open up a service not with worship, but the first thing they do in this service is present a naked man to the men of God. Now what bugged me the most about this, many things, but what bugged me the most about this is I've been part of a larger church before. I understand the planning that goes into it. I understand all the opinions and the names that are attached to this event. I understand all the meetings that go on throughout the year in order for this event to take place. And what amazes me the most is that through all these meetings, through all of these interactions with their pastor, with the, the planning team, with everyone that's involved in making this event happen, not one person had the burden to stand up and say, that doesn't belong in the house of God. Not one person had the burden to say, I don't know what kind of church you're trying to create here, but the men of God don't need to see that when they're coming to be built up. All of the planning that took place for this men's meeting and not one person had the courage or the guts to say, that does not belong in the house of God. Now, not only did it get so far as to actually taking place at this event, but as it's taking place, not one man in the entire arena had the courage to say, had the burden on their heart to stand up and say, this is an abomination before God. How dare you do this in the holy presence of Jesus Christ? Where is the respect for the Holy Spirit? Not one man in a room filled with 8,000 had the uh, burden to stand up and say, this is wrong. Now, I noticed later on in this video that the next day, there's a pastor by the name of Mark Driscoll that was asked to preach. And before he comes up and starts his sermon... He comes up and takes the microphone and he just takes a knee. Now, I don't know if he had been watching online or if he was there in person. But I, I, I'm pretty sure if he was in person while all this was going on, he would have said something. But what he does instead of preaching is he takes a knee and he says, I've been up all night crying and weeping because of what took place at this event last night. And as he begins talking and he's saying that you've built an altar, and in the middle of the altar you've built a pole, and you've let this man commit sexual acts in front of you, and he begins to openly rebuke them in front of all of these people. And before he can get even two minutes into this rebuke that he has for God's people, the lead pastor of this event says, that's it Mark, you're done, get off the stage. And as a respectful man of God like he is, he says, I received that, Pastor. I'll, I'll remove myself from your stage. And he walks off the stage. One man saw what happened on that stage the night before, and God put a burden on him to come before the people of God and let them know that what's taking place here is not of me. What's taking place here is wrong. What's taking place here has caused my spirit to remove myself from this event. And now all you're doing is coming together and having a motivational time. Motivational talk. Learning how to be better worldly men because you've removed God from the picture. And when one man had the burden to say what was wrong, the pastor says, no, that's enough. Stop that. But when a man comes up here and removes his clothing, the pastor stays silent. Where is our burden for righteousness? Where is our burden for the respect of the God that we serve? 
Where is the burden for preserving the Holy Spirit in the house of God? Where is our burden for making sure that God feels comfortable in his home? The spirit of passivity has found its way into the church. The spirit of cowardness has found its way into the church. The church has found itself at a place where we feel the need to be entertained rather than corrected. I don't understand how a group full of 8,000 men who paid good money to be at this event could come and sit there and be okay and accept the fact that this is just going to be an entertaining time versus we're going to build you to be stronger men of God. The church has settled for entertainment and it's taken place of being rebuked, being built up, being taught, and we've become comfortable with it. The church has lost the violent burden it was birthed into. To seeing the lost set free, seeing idols and false gods brought down, seeing demonic beings exposed and cast out, and the violent fight which we were called to war in has been handed over to a very few men and women who are still willing to fight. Matthew eleven twelve says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Tonight, the title of this message is A Violent Burden. This scripture says, From the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has been in a spiritual battle. The only way to win that battle is to put on the burden of violence that God has given to us. To put on that burden of violence and say, we're going to take back the kingdom of God that we are called to war for. Where are the men and women of God today that have a violent burden for the kingdom? Where are the men and women of God that have a violent burden to seeing the lost come to Jesus? Where is the church that has a violent burden to going out into the community and seeing it transformed by the power of Jesus? The devil and his demons are real. The Bible tells us that the devil and his demons go to and fro on this world seeking someone that they can devour. That means that they travel this world Violently looking for someone that they can devour, that they can overtake, that they can completely consume and destroy. This is the plan of the enemy. The plan of the enemy has violence attached to it. The plan of the enemy for our church is violent. The plan that the devil has for your children is violent. The plan that he has for your marriage is violent. He wants to take all of these things and completely destroy them. Why is it that the plan of the devil is so violent and so ferocious and so without ceasing, but when I look at the church today, the people of God have taken the violent burden that they were given when they were saved and they've taken it off and placed it on the ground. And they've left it behind. When Jesus found us in our old life, he called us out, he saved us, and he gave us a plan and a purpose. That plan and purpose is to advance the kingdom of God. To advance the kingdom of God. How on earth can we advance the kingdom of God when we put down the violence and we know we've been enlisted into a spiritual war? How can you advance the kingdom of God that's like enlisting into the army and refusing to take the gun that they give you when you enlist? How can you enlist in the army of God and take off the burden of spiritual violence he gave you when he called you out of that old life? Everything that the church does is done with the intention of being violent to the camp of the enemy. 
But when I look around America today, the violence has been taken out of the church and we become stuck and comfortable and lukewarm. How can we advance the kingdom if we've taken off the burden of violence God gave us? We can. That's why we see the church in the state that it's in today. That's why we see Christians in the state that they're in today. We were not saved to be put on a shelf and look cute like a trophy. We weren't pulled out of that old life just so that we could feel better about ourselves and stay stuck in that spot where God found us. God pulled us out of that life so that we would have the burden of violence stirring up inside of us to say, God, I'm going back behind enemy lines and taking back everything that the devil took from me before I knew you. But the church has lost its burden. Christians have lost their burden. It's so disgusting to see every day you get on the internet, you see the church falling deeper and deeper and deeper into the hand of the enemy. It's saddening. If you can look at the state of the church today and not feel sorrow in your spirit, do you really know God? We should have a burden to see the church prosper. We should have a burden to see the lost set free. We should have a burden to go out of these walls and outreach to the people who are broken and hurting. God saved us with the intention of enlisting you in the armed forces of heaven and dispatching us into the enemy's camp. Where is the violence we've been called to? Outreach is not some cute thing we do to go out and start a conversation with people and find out if they believe in God. Outreach is a violent act where you walk out of these doors and you're saying, hey, Satan, I'm stepping into your territory and I'm going to snatch out of your hands as many people as I can. When was the last time we showed up to an outreach with the intention of going to battle? But instead, we can become comfortable standing under a tent, putting hot dogs in a bun, handing them to people, and never asking for their name. Where is your burden for violence? Where is the burden to see the lost set free? Every life that you come into contact with out there is a soul. If you were to walk out of this building today and you saw flames coming out of the top of Stater Brothers, but you look inside and there's still people shopping, they don't know that there's a fire that's about to burn down the building, would you stay silent? Or would you say, hey, wake up! The building is on fire! You're going to die! But we can walk out of this place and walk past hundreds of people every day knowing that they're going to hell and never open our mouth. Where is the burden to say, I'm violently taking as many people as I can from the hands of the devil? Where is our burden? John the Baptist preached one message. Jesus lived his entire life preaching one message. Paul preached one message. Repent. The kingdom of God is here. And if you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. And the church concerns itself with coming up here on a Sunday and making sure you know that they know all the things there is to know in the Bible. They can teach you a thousand lessons. 
But so few pastors stand up here and say, hell's real. Where's your burden to save people that are going there? The entire purpose that God pulled you out was so you would bring someone with you. And he gave you that burden to go out and find them. But the church has taken it off. Where is our burden tonight? When we come in this building and we walk in to a worship service, we don't do worship up here because it's to start the service, because it's cute so you can stand here and you can try to make sure you sound good and you can make sure you look nice. The entire purpose of worship is to physically stir up the spiritual atmosphere in order to affect change in the natural realm. We are physically going to war with our worship in order to do damage in the spiritual world so that we see the results here in the natural. But we're comfortable just clapping, lifting our hands. Where is your burden? Where is our burden? Where is our burden to do damage to the darkness? The church has become so comfortable. We've become so comfortable with placing the burden aside and saying, I'm just going to go through the motions. We come to this church on Wednesdays, Fridays, Sundays. The purpose of coming to these services is not so we fulfill some religious obligation to say that we made it to the building. The entire purpose of stepping foot into this building is we are drawing a line in the sand and proclaiming to the devil and the enemy that we are saying, this is where I stand and I'm preparing to go to war. You're showing the side you've chose. And we act like something crazy is happening when we draw the line, walk out the door, and all of hell comes against us. You are in a spiritual war. Put back on the burden for violence. God's kingdom has become so wimpy. We refuse to fight. We refuse to wield our swords. We've taken off the truth. We don't stand on the word. You know what Jesus told his disciples? He says, Peter, this is the rock on which I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. He's telling, I'm going to build my church on the word. And if my church is built on the word, no matter what's happening in the world around them, they will know to keep on that burden I put inside of them and do war so that the gates of hell do not prevail. But we've taken it off because we've stepped out of the word. Do you know why Jesus washed the feet of his disciples before he left earth? He knew his time was coming. He sat there and washed each one of their feet one by one. Because Jesus knew that the entire three years he had spent with them, he had spent water, putting seeds in the soil, putting seeds in the soil, putting seeds in the soil. You can put seeds in the soil all you want, but if you don't water them, you'll never see any fruit from it. So Jesus knew that my disciples are going to have to stand firm in my word when I'm leaving. So the seeds that I've planted, I've got to water their feet so that the word grows at their foundation and they're not moved to and fro at whatever comes for them. The water represents the word. He puts their feet into the word. That's why the Bible says that your word is like a lamp into my feet. It guides our path. But when we step off of the word, 
The burden leaves us. We can't make any impact in the enemy's kingdom when we've taken off the burden and stepped out of the word. Have we put down our burden of violence this evening? You know what bothers me the most? I've been in church for a long time. And I've seen people, as they come in and get saved, that when they came into the church, they were violent, wicked, nasty people. Their first few months of being saved, you couldn't even look at them without them wanting to tear you apart. If you said hi to them the wrong way, they were ready to fight you in the parking lot. But as they stay saved for a few months, a few years, that violence that was a part of them in the world, when they get brought into the kingdom, they allow it to dissipate. So the effectiveness that God saw in them outside of these walls that he brought them into in order to have more effectiveness in the kingdom, they take it off. Where is the violence that you had out there? Some of us were vicious people outside of these walls. Some of us lost every relationship we ever had because we were violent. Some of our family members won't speak to us anymore because we were violent. And now we've got saved and God's put our life back together. And the violence that we're supposed to keep going in the name of Jesus, we've said, God changed me from that. Have you taken off your burden for violence tonight? There are people outside of these walls that are dying every day. Why are we not violently burdened to save as many as we can? This isn't just for you. This is for me. God's been tearing me up all week about this. When was the last time you opened your mouth to someone and said, Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? When is the last time you shared the gospel with someone that you don't know? There are bondages and chains that have been tied around your family, my family, for generations. Generations and generations and generations of the same bondage, the same garbage, the same chains that have tied us down. Why are you not burdened to completely disintegrate them, dissolve them, to break them off, to throw them off? Where is your burden to fight for breakthrough for your own family? What you refuse to break now, your children and their children and their children will deal with. Are you that much of a coward that you would pass on the things you struggle with to your children? If you're a man in this place and you would say, I struggle with all of these different things, but I'm not violently motivated to get rid of them, you're a coward. How dare you pass those things to your children? How dare you pass that pornography to your children? How dare you pass that spirit of lust to your children? How dare you pass that pride to your children? Where is your burden for violence to say, all of the things inside of me that don't line up with the Word of God, I must go to war and get rid of them. Where is your burden? You can see the plan of the devil working violently in the church today. Every day, every week, every hour is something new. Where is our burden to say enough is enough? We're going to reclaim the sanctity of the church, the holiness of the Holy Spirit's presence. We are going to reclaim the very presence of God that says He'll leave us if we don't honor Him. Where is our burden? Instead, what we find today is these kinds of Christians. 
They've taken the burden off. And all of the things that they're supposed to be fighting against, they say the pastor will do it. All of the things they're supposed to be warring against, they'll say my Bible study leader will fight it. All of the bondages they find themselves in, they go to a service and they say the deliverance ministry will get rid of it. What cowards have we become to where we've taken off our own burden, placed it on the ground, and left it there for the next man to pick up? We've put down our swords that God's called us to do war with and left it for our children to come pick up after us. Let me put it like this. Who scared you enough to make you put down your burden? What trial was too much for you to say, I'm done, I'm taking it off, I'm putting it down. I refuse to keep fighting if the battle's just going to get harder and harder and harder. What happened in your life to say, this is too much, I'm taking the burden for violence off and placing it here? God gave you that burden for a reason, for a purpose, for a plan. How selfish of us to take it off when it's convenient and to go back and try to pick it up when we feel more comfortable with the life we're living. How selfish. This is the state of the church. We've become selfish Christians that we're given a burden, and when life gets too tough, we take it off, and now we find ourselves worried about ourselves, worried about getting through this battle, worried about this financial breakthrough, worried about what's going on in my family right now. When the burden you were given was to help fight for others, now you're only worried about yourself. How selfish have we become? Where is your burden for the kingdom? The church has found itself in a very dangerous place. We expect the next man to pick up our sword. This is a scary place to be. When we do this, we are literally, spiritually, we are taking off our defenses and we're telling Satan, the gates open, come in. We're taking off the very tool God gave us to hold the enemy off and saying, go ahead, Satan. It's free game. Come in. This is why we see the things we see today. When we take off the mandate or the natural inclination we've been given for spiritual violence, we now find ourselves in a place of self-perseverance. Instead of being worried about others and protecting others and advancing the kingdom by breaking strongholds, witnessing, worshiping, bringing people to Jesus, now we find ourselves in a place where we are just worried about ourselves. We were called to be an offensive people. And by taking off that burden that God gave you, now you are forced to live on the defensive. Now, instead of going out and attacking the enemy, we sit back and we wait for him to come to us. And we wonder why we get so overwhelmed with the trials that come our way. You were supposed to meet that trial miles down the road before it ever got as big as it is and take it out before it grew. But you took off your burden and now it met you farther down the road. What happened to make you take it off? Instead of being attackers, now we are reacting to the attacks the enemy has for us. A great example of this in Scripture is Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, 9 through 8, it says this, or 8 through 9, 9 through 10, sorry. It says, There Elijah went into a cave and stayed all night. 
Then the Lord spoke his word to him, Elijah, why are you here? He answered, Lord, God all-powerful, I have always served you as well as I could. But the people of Israel have broken their agreement with you, destroyed your altars, and killed your prophets with swords. I am the only prophet left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Elijah has just witnessed one of the greatest moves of God in all of history. Elijah stood as fire came down from heaven, completely consumed an altar. And God took out hundreds of prophets of Baal and Asherah. He watched as God did this with his own eyes. And after he watches as the Holy Spirit does one of the greatest moves we've ever seen on earth, Elijah gets a note from Jezebel that says, I'm going to kill you. Now when Elijah reads that note, instead of focusing on the God that he just witnessed, instead of focusing on the power of the God that he serves, that he just seen, he's focused on himself. And Jezebel scares him to take off that burden. Jezebel scares him to take off what God put on him. Elijah got scared. Elijah got lost. And Elijah ran. He shifted his focus from the power of God to the threats and fear he was experiencing. When we sub submit ourselves to the fear and the threats and battles of the enemy, we back ourselves into a corner and we try to hide from the battle. We were not called to hide. We were called to attack. How many of us this has happened in our lives? Where we're doing great for God. We're on fire for God. Every service we come to, we can feel the Holy Spirit all over us. Then something happens in your life that forces you to take a step back from the forward progress you'd been making. And that burden to advance in your walk with God gets taken off. And now you find yourselves lonely, in a dark and desolate place, dry, without water, not spending time with God. And when you're in that place, you hear a whisper that says, come out. I have something to say to you. Why are you hiding? What made you take off the burden and go into the cave? Come out. I have a word for you. Many of us choose to ignore that voice. In 1 Kings 19, it says, The Lord said to him, He's talking to Elijah, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint... Hazel, king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Eliashon of Shaphat, from Abel Meloha to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. What is God doing here? What is he telling Elijah? He's placing the burden for violence back on his shoulders. He's telling him, I know you're in hiding from that woman. I know that you're hiding from what's going on outside of this cave. But I've come and I've called you out of the cave in order to put back on the burden of violence that I had given you when I called you. Elijah was called to go to war for the people of Israel and bring the kingdom up. He was called to bring the kingdom of Israel back to God. To do a spiritual battle with the people that were taking over this place in order to bring it back to Jesus. But when he receives this threat, he retreats, he steps back, he goes into hiding. 
even when you're scared. The war you were called to doesn't change. And when you finally get yourself together, and you finally get back to God, and you finally say, okay, God, I'm ready, you guess what he does? He puts that anointing for violence back on you. And he says, now go back to what you've been hiding from. The battle that you've been trying to avoid, now you're going back to fight it. You never know who you're infecting or affecting when you're acting in violence. Who you're anointing in the next generation that's called to continue the fight that you were called to. Elijah was called to bring Israel out of captivity. But God says what he couldn't do, now you've anointed the very man who will finish the job. And the Bible says that he anoints Jehu, and Jehu rides like a madman with an act of violence to the very throne of Jezebel. And he finishes what Elijah had anointed him to do. You never know who you're affecting when you're obedient to God's act of violence. Don't get comfortable playing church. Don't get comfortable coming and sitting here and listening to a sermon. Anyone can, can do this. Anyone can come up here and talk. But it takes a real man and woman of God to say, God, the burden that you put on me when I walk out of these doors, let me live it out. Everyone wants to be up here. Everyone wants a microphone in their hand. Everyone wants a platform. But God is saying, I'm looking for just one person that would say, God, I don't need the recognition. God, I want to be undercover for you. God, I want nobody to know my name, but I want to make the most impact in the kingdom of the enemy. I don't care if all of the world forgets me when I die. Satan will know my name. Yes, come on. But the church is focused about how many followers they have on their Instagram. Yes. How many followers are on their church page? How many people come into their service on a Sunday morning? When there are real men and women of God still in this world that are saying, I could care less about the numbers. God, let me make an impact for your kingdom. Where is your burden? Where is our burden? Your fear is irrelevant. Your feeling of unworthiness is not important. Your inabilities do not matter. When you are backed by the Spirit of God and He's given you a mandate, it's your duty to go back and do it. Some of us need to put that burden back on today. Some of us need to go back to those family members that curse us because we're a Christian. That can't stand us because we're living for God. That are constantly reminding us of who we were, trying to pull us back into that old life. And say, I'm going to ignore all it is you have to say about me. Because God has put a mandate of violence in order for me to war for your soul. How many of our family members don't know Jesus? And we stay away from them because they've always got something to say about God. They've always got something to say about our church. They've always got something to say about our pastor. They've always got something to say about our children. So we avoid them. Are you honestly telling me God has not put a burden on your heart for their souls. I never want to go to heaven and see someone there that comes up to me and tells me, you were a Christian? All those times we spent together? 
And not once did you think to tell me about Jesus? Not once did you tell me you went to church? Not once did you tell me that you had a spirit that lives inside of you that allows you to do things for God? A power that anoints you to heal sick? Not once did it come up? Where is our burden? Where is our burden? These are souls. These are souls. God came down. The Bible says if we were the only ones, He would have sent His Son just to die for that one person. But we can open our mouth for one person. He's not asking you to kill yourself. He's not asking you to be crucified. He's just saying, tell them who I am. Where is our burden? Some of us need to go back and revisit those past hurts and traumas that have caused us to live a life of bondage and say, God has put the burden for violence back on me. No more will I live in these restraints. But God has enabled me and empowered me to break loose from them. The church needs to take back that violent burden and reclaim the holiness of the church. Reclaim the sanctity of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Reclaim the reverence for a Sunday morning. Reclaim the reverence for a men's meeting. Reclaim the Holy Spirit's abundance when we walk into this place. The Bible tells us if two or three of us show up, He's in our midst, yet we treat Him like He's trash. Where's our burden? And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. You can see it all around today. You can see it all around today. That just this week, a Holy Spirit on fire, man of God, was up on his pulpit preaching. And a Muslim man came all the way down the church and stabbed him as he's preaching. That can't happen in this church. That can't happen in this church. You're going to tell me not one man that sat in that service had a burden to stand up and run after this man to protect their pastor. But we do the same thing to the kingdom of God. We watch as the world rushes down the aisle, coming after our church, coming after the kingdom, coming after the name of Jesus with their fornication and their drugs and their LGBTQ agendas, all of these things, shoving them down the throat of God. And we stay seated and say nothing and do nothing to chase them down. Do nothing to bring them down. Do nothing to tell them that Jesus is not pleased with the life that they're living. Where's your burden? Can you really sit here today and watch as all of these things go on around you? And tell me that something inside of your spirit is not uneasy. That God has not been stirring something up inside of you. The Bible says that in the last days God will raise up a remnant. If this church is not part of that remnant, I will be very disappointed. I did not come back to the things of God to be religious. I did not come back to the things of God to go through the motions. I did not come back to the things of God just to go through the motions and say I came to church. I want to see the Holy Spirit totally, radically encounter everyone that comes into this building. But He can't do that if we take the burden off. He can't do that if we don't go out and violently bring people in.
Let God put that burden back on you. It's time for us to get violent in our walk. It's time for us to get violent in our walk. I didn't want to be long tonight. I'm not going to pray for anybody today. But this is the kind of message that you know if you're living up to it. You know what God's put on your heart. You know the conversations you have with God when you're driving, when you're in your, your room, when you're going to bed, when you're taking a shower. You know the thoughts God drops in your heart. You know the times you walk past that people and felt the Holy Spirit leading you to talk to them and you've turned around and went the other way. You know all of these things. You know the burdens you've ignored and you know the ones that you've continued to carry today. Tonight, God wanted to remind us that he gave you the burden of violence for the kingdom. This altar is open for anyone that wants to talk to him tonight. Let's stand to our feet if we can. Amen. Listen. That message that Jonathan just ministered is a message of truth and of challenge in our lives today. There is one thing that God is looking for in these last days is the people that are obedient and willing to be used by God himself. Just begin to talk to the Lord for a few moments. Just begin to talk to God right there where you're at. Let the Spirit of God begin to minister to you. Let it begin to challenge you. Lord, let your Spirit begin to illuminate areas of our lives that are not right with you, Jesus. Concerning the burden of your people. Father, I pray right now, Lord God, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would begin to cause an unsettledness within our lives. I pray that as we live on our lives, Lord God, these next few days, that it would be a, a burden that is stirred over and over and over within us. That you would cause us, Lord God, to begin to see people in a different way. That you would cause us to look at family members in a different way. That we would see, Lord God, not the people, that we would see the destinies and the eternity within them, Lord God. That you've given us a message of hope and a message of power and a message of freedom. So, Lord, I declare right now, Lord God, that each and every one of us in this room, Lord, that you have saved and you have washed. That you help us to open up our mouths, Lord God, and share with those you come and you bring to us. Father, we have the words of hope. We have the words of life. We have the words of eternity. And Father, I pray that you would cause a stirring within our hearts, God, that we would not be contained, that we would not think about the handicaps or the hindrances or the inabilities that we may have to share and open up our mouths to others. For Father, we never know if that is the only time that they will have left to hear the gospel of Jesus. So, Father, I pray a stirring within us now, a stirring within our hearts, God, of repentance and a stirring of awakening, Lord God, within us. Lord, you've called us to this city of Highland, Lord God, not to just be a church like every other church, but to be a church that walks in the violence of the gospel. That we become aggressive in sharing the word. That we see the damnation and destruction of lies. And that we would become aggressive in sharing the word of God of hope. That we would not be a people, Lord God, that gather around this building and be fed the word and leave without pouring it out unto others. Lord, let us be your vessel tonight. Your vessel that receives and pour out, God. So I pray, Lord God, for an anointing over us right now. I thank you for the word that was preached, and I pray an anointing over us, God, 
that you would anoint us with power, that you would anoint us with the words of wisdom, that you would give us words of revelation, words of insight, that as we contact people, Lord God, this week, that you would give us the insight to speak into their soul, God, and that we would look at them the way that you see them, God, not how we see them, but how you see them. Lies that need to be redeemed. Lies that need hope and destiny. Bless us, Lord God, today. Let us be the light, Lord God, in this city. Let us be a temple, Lord God, that shines upon the lives and the souls of people. That people would be drawn to us because we are your children. Because we have been transformed and changed by your glory. So bless us, Lord God, tonight. Strengthen us and encourage us with your power. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise offering. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jonathan, for that word. Amen. Listen, I'm going to ask you to do something tonight. I'm going to ask you that as you leave today, after you fellowship for a while here, and as you leave, you get at least five of those cards that we have on that table. And here's what I want you to do. Once a day only, just once a day. If you're at the market, let the Holy Spirit tell you, who do you want me to give this card to? Stop and tell them, can I talk to you for a moment? And share the gospel with them. If you're eating at a restaurant and a waiter comes to, sit, to serve you at the table and they bring you the food and you say, before you leave, we're going to pray for our food. Can I pray for you? Is there something that I can pray for you for? And pray for them right there. Amen? Go to your neighbor. Say, hi, how are you? Bring them something. Say, can I pray for you? You've been on my heart. And pray for them. How, what is the reason and what is the good thing if we are the light and the Bible says we keep that light hidden? The light is meant to be put on a hill so that everyone can see the light. That's what Jesus says about you and I. That we are the light of the world. Amen? And we need to let our light shine. Can you imagine if each and every one of us here today, this week, would invite one person to church? We'd have to knock down that wall in a couple of weeks because we wouldn't fit in the sanctuary. I'm being honest with you. We are called to be the light of the Lord. We are called to be violent and share the gospel. The devil was violent over you. You've got to be violent over the devil's work. Amen? And share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you this week. Every day this week, listen, until Sunday, you invite somebody to church. Get that flyer. Pray for them. Invite them. Amen? I want to challenge you. You're going to see how it's going to bring a fire over your soul, but it's also going to build the kingdom of God. Is that all right? Amen? Don't be just listen. Don't be listeners of God's word. That is a shame. That is a shame. I love how Jonathan presented that if there's a building on fire, will you just drive by and let it burn? I'll never forget, I was coming back from a prayer meeting years ago, me and my friend Mauricio in Huntington Park, and we were driving on the way right there on Gage, actually on Arbutus and Florence. And we turned the corner and I saw some flames. And I saw a house being burned. And my, son, my friend was driving and he said, check that out. I said, Mauricio, tur turn around. She said, what for? I saw somebody in that living room as we drove by. He says, you're crazy. I said, no. We turned around. He stood in the car. I ran into the building, pulled out an old lady with her dog and pulled her out as the flames were taking place. I could not leave knowing that I saw someone and pretend that I did not see them and they were going to burn themselves to death. Listen to me. I tell you that because of this. That is exactly what is happening in the lives of people every day. We can walk down people's lives and they're burning for eternity in hell and we can be okay with that. We can't. If we're called to be a church here in Highland, we have to be ones that will share the gospel and the message of Jesus. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's pull them out of the flames. Bless the Lord. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Ben, I'm really happy Ben's with us here tonight. Amen. Got out of work earlier. Ben, why don't you come over here and seal us in prayer. Amen.
right, Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. You're an awesome God. You're an amazing God, Lord. We, we thank you so much, Father, for that word that was presented to us tonight, Father God. So that, that's our prayer, Lord. Just let that word just resonate all around us, Father God. Just instill that word into our, into our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and our souls, Father God. Let, let this not just be a message that was just preached on a random Wednesday night, Father. Let that not be a, a message that will just go in through one ear and out the other, Father God. But we are believing, Lord, that that message will spark a flame tonight, Father God. We are believing that that message is going to start a fire here at the bridge, Father God. It's going to start a fire in each and every one of our hearts, Father God. We, we will no longer... Uh, be a, a, a church that just listens and goes on about our days or our nights, Father God. We will now have a burden for souls, Father God. So as we leave tonight, Lord, we accept Pastor Carlos's challenge, Father God. We will have a burden for souls, Father God. We're going to hit the streets, Lord. We're going to invite people. We're going to pass out flyers, Father God. Lord, we will not stop until this house is filled, Father God. Again, Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for that message that was presented to us tonight, Father God. Lord, right now, we, we pray for traveling mercies, Lord, as everyone heads on out, Father God. Get us all to our destinations, Father God. And again, Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for sparking a fire in us tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you, Ben. Praise the Lord. How many are happy tonight? Amen? Listen, I got one more thing to do. Can you come here for a moment? Come here. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I am. Praise the Lord. We're so blessed you're back here again. We've been praying for you. Amen. Believing God to do great things in your life. Listen, this is her second time here. And uh, we don't want people to be overlooked. Who, what woman here would say, you know what? I'm going to pick her up. I'm going to take her to lunch or dinner this week. Who would like to do that? Diane? Diane's going to get your number. Whether this week or next week, cover your schedules, work out, and she's going to take you to dinner or lunch. Because we care for you. We've been praying for you. Okay? Amen. Thank you, Diane. This is what it's all about. Amen? Connecting with people, ministering to people, sharing our lives with people. We love you. God bless you. Fellowship for a while. You're dismissed. Amen. Don't come empty-handed Sunday. Amen? Oh, yes, don't forget, Saturday, my daughter is going to be ministering to the young women, ages 16 to 27. It's going to be awesome. She is ready to go Saturday at 6 o'clock here. Amen. Saturday at 6 o'clock here, show up. She's going to have refreshments, some time of ministering for young women, 16 to 27. Amen. 6 p.m.